much for inviting me. I've always been a long time, you know, fan of uh, this this series, and it's really nice to have an opportunity to talk maybe a bit more about the theoretical side of uh, someone's neuroscience work. And in the spirit of kind of Carl Van Riesbeck's uh, stuff, I'm going to talk a lot about just like scaling limits of very large kind of neural networks and reason about like the size of the uh, input currents coming into a into a neuron and reasoning about how much these change during learning. So. Um, with that, just a bit about me and my sort of research interests. Um, I'm basically interested in theories of learning and both kind of like artificial and biological neural networks. So for example, in like an artificial neural network, um, you might be interested in the problem, like suppose you're given an architecture, some kind of, you know, convolutional neural network, for example, or a recurrent neural network or a transformer or something, and um, some kind of learning rule, some kind of update procedure for all the weights, and something, you're, you're given some data distribution. So maybe like uh, image net classifications. So, you know, you have a thousand categories of objects and you want to categorize uh, given some in input image, what is the corresponding class associated with this input image? And in general, as theorists, we would like to have some handle or some understanding on like uh, the sample complexity for this problem. Like how many examples from each category, for example, do I need to see before I have like an accurate predictor? Um, the learned representation. So as this thing evolves, how do the neurons inside the network sort of like uh, adapt their internal features so that they respond to special specialized ways to certain stimuli? How does the population encode information about stimuli? And then also dynamics. So how long does it take to sort of train this model to a, to a good performance? Um, and, you know, in terms of connections to neuroscience, I mean, obviously these artificial models are very impoverished uh, sort of toy cartoons of like real biological neural networks, but somehow um, sort of optimizing these, these simple systems that are like loosely inspired by some connectionist uh, principles, somehow, you know, when you optimize them on certain tasks, like just these object categorization tasks, or maybe some like uh, you train an RNN on some uh, context dependent, like a reasoning task or something, the, the internal representations in the toy models sometimes have some similarities to the to, to, to what's recorded in the real brain. So for example, similarity matrices in uh, like layers of a convolutional network. So for two different stimuli, how similar are the internal representations after training uh, for those two stimuli in this population uh, response space? Um, those can look a lot, those similarity matrices can look very similar to what's reported maybe in monkey IT uh, for those same corresponding set of stimuli. So, I mean, that's sort of interesting. And in general, the, the, the idea that I'm interested in is just this, uh, trying to understand the relationship between the task that you're sort of like training the system on, the, the structure of the architecture, how it's being trained, and also the like final or learned representations, and how these things kind of all interact to, um, during learning. So. But of course, there's the usual disclaimers. Like we don't we don't have full full control over all these things in the real brain. We don't we don't know all of these things. We don't know the learning rules or the actual you know what is a good task to mimic the structure of these things. We don't know the connectivity structure. However, these these simple artificial models, you know, you can interrogate them uh, and make theories of them and test them very quickly. So as as a sort of complementary project, I think it's worth trying to understand deep networks. Um, and today I'm just going to talk about basically one sort of recent approach that we've been trying to take, which is this idea of dynamical mean field theory applied to neural network training dynamics. So thinking about neural networks in a particular limit and trying to capture how their features evolve over time. Okay, so what is dynamical mean field theory? I mean, you guys are, the, everyone in this, in this call is probably more of an expert on this than I am. I mean, uh, I, I think I'm preaching to the choir here, but in general, in case you haven't heard of this term, it, the idea of dynamical mean field theory is you're going to study some disordered high dimensional dynamical system, and uh, you're going to try to analyze it in terms of some lower dimensional, uh, maybe set of order parameters like correlation and response functions. So the classic example in neuroscience that people study are RNNs with sort of random asymmetric weights. So this is, you know, originally in, introduced by Sam Polinsky, Chrysanti, and Summers, and there's a wonderful book by uh, Moritelius and David Dahman, and there's several papers by many people on this call uh, on this topic, but the idea is basically I have uh, some input current to some in some RNN, so this is H for neuron I, and at time t, it, it has some differential equation with a leak term and also some recurrent term. So I, I apply nonlinearity to map the input currents to some firing rate, uh, so that's this 5H transformation. And then I sum up all the uh, recurrent weights, WIJ times these things. And I just think about these WIJ weights as completely random, unstructured uh, random variables. And I want to think about this as a model in the high dimensional limit. Okay, so this at, at first glance seems really complicated. This is a nonlinear differential equation with like a, a huge number of degrees of freedom. And what makes progress in this model possible? Uh, the key idea is some, some, some notion of concentration. So at, at infinite width, there's some self-averaging order parameters. Uh, so for instance, the autocorrelation. So if I look at the firing rate of all the neurons at time t and do a dot product with all the ne uh, neurons firing rates at time t plus tau, this sort of this object will, in the limit of large n, concentrate to some limiting 
thing. So the population average over neurons will converge to some limiting average over some some dense, some probability density. What is this probability density? So conditional on this 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 kernel object or this correlation function concentrating, each neuron follows a sort of single site stochastic random uh, stochastic process. So I could think about a typical neuron in the network as a random variable. So there's a distribution over what each neuron in the network is doing. And I could think about the stochastic process for that neuron as being driven by like uh, basically a leaky integrator of some recurrent neural network noise. So this eta is basically um, an effective uh, an effective description of basically this input recurrent uh, current from the, the WIJs. And this thing basically follows a Gaussian process with covariance phi. And when we do this kind of trade, what are we, or when, we when we do this kind of reduction from this, uh, this, this, this original system to this low dimension, lower dimensional description, we're going from like a high dimensional Markovian system, where if I knew all the WIJs and I know the state of all these N neurons in this original differential equation, I could integrate forward in time and I don't need to worry so much about correlations through time. I go from that kind of description to a description of a single uh, stochastic process and a single neuron where I have to track correlations across time. So I go from a sort of random Markovian system to a non-random, uh, to a lower lower dimensional, like a sort of non-Markovian deterministic system. So on the kernel. So in, I mean, so the key the key question in this, oh, and I'll, I'll just say, by the way, like you can gain lots of insights just by studying these kinds of limits and these reductions. So like, for instance, you know, in this case, transitions to chaos is a function of this G parameter and everything else. You can, you can get all of that from this, this kind of framework. So I think it'd be nice if we could do something like this for sort of deep neural network training dynamics. So the time is being like number of training steps during training. Um, so what would such a theory like uh, look like there? So I'm going to focus on basically neural networks, deep neural networks in this talk, and deep neural networks in sort of a wide ne wide uh, network limit. So that means basically if I have a, a neural network that maps inputs X to outputs F of X, I go through a bunch of hidden layers, and each hidden layer has sort of width in. And I'm going to think about in this width to be uh, sort of going toward infinity. Um, so for instance, I have X. X is being mapped. X is a d-dimensional vector, some input. It's being mapped through the first layer weights to some pre-activation, some input currents, H1. There are N of these. And then I have basically between hidden layers of recursion where I uh, I multiply by you know weights between layer L and layer L plus one. And um, after I do this, I apply basically a nonlinearity to each of the, the input currents to get some firing rate, uh, similar to the last, the, uh, the last model. And notice I have these factors of square root of D in the first layer and square root of N in the second layer. This is just sort of for central limit theorem kind of reasons. So this is just basically to keep the variance of these objects order one and the limit. And in the last layer, I'm going to do the same thing um, for the readout, except I'm going to include an extra scale factor gamma. And this gamma is going to be crucial to characterizing whether I get a feature learning limit or whether I get basically what's called the lazy kernel limit. Um, and so the, the game, the goal, uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to do is I want to say, OK, just like in the RNN model where we had some kind of random connections, uh, and then we, we thought about sort of dynamics on top of those random connections here, I want to basically think about starting from a random initial condition for the network. So like, you know, do what you usually do when you train a model in PyTorch. You just randomly initialize all the weights. And then on top of that, I want to do some gradient-based learning of the weights. And I want to try characterizing the dynamics of the network uh, when I do this. And so crucially, it's going to, what, what's going to be crucial here is how does gamma scale with n? So the scale factor gamma is going to control the rate of internal feature learning. So it's going to control how fast basically the input neurons uh, sort of change their internal representations. If I keep this object as order one, if I keep it as a constant with width, I get what's called neural tangent scaling. And this is uh, has been studied by, you know, Jaco et al. and Lee et al. and several other papers. And, uh, you know, we've worked a bit on this limit as well. But in this limit, basically, you could think about each neuron as sort of having like a fixed receptive field. Like it's not adapting its uh, internal representations to the stimuli during learning. Um, but the network is still still capable of fitting the function. There's this other scaling, however, where I take this gamma to scale like square root of the width. Okay, and if I do this, this is known as mean field scaling. And this has been, this was first sort of proposed into a two layer network by Song Mei et al. And then extended to other architectures by Greg Yang and colleagues. It's also in some circles known as mu p maximum parameterization. Um, so I'm going to try to get like illustrating like the difference or like what's at stake here with these different scalings. So suppose I start with a, you know, um, a, you know, a standard out of the box kind of a CNN, a ResNet with 64 channels in each layer, okay? And I'm gonna train this model on, um, you know, CIFAR 10, just standard SGD training. Um, and I'm gonna try considering like larger and larger width versions of this model. So I'm gonna start with this model and I'm gonna try multiplying the width by factors of two. So first I'm gonna do this in NTK parameterization. So now all these new dashed colored lines are uh, different, um, wider and wider versions of this model. And I see that I don't, you know, I went from like maybe having faster training dynamics, though the test loss was going down more quickly, 
to a slower sort of training dynamics. Uh, I don't have kind of consistent dynamics across widths. And partly this is because, and we'll discuss why this is happening, but it's because I'm like going from a model that's learning features at finite width to a model that doesn't have any uh, feature updates at infinite width. And um, yeah, so I noticed just empirically, like in this experiment, you see as I, if I keep this gamma as a constant, I am getting worse performance, even though I'm spending more and more compute to train these larger and larger models, I'm getting actually like worse performance at a fixed cutoff time. However, now if I train the models with this gamma scaling like square root of n, so the mean field uh, parameterization, that's these solid lines that I just added, I see I get very similar kind of performance across widths, or, and if anything, I'm doing kind of better as I, uh, as I make the network wider. And um, I mean, as a theorist, right, if I'm, if I'm trying to characterize the dynamics of, uh, you know, let's say I care about like what happens in a finite width neural network, my argument is the, because this mean field model is converging to its limit more quickly, or uh, finite models are sort of closer to the limit, this, is, this limit might be a better approximation of what finite networks are really like. And so my proposal is basically to study uh, infinite width feature learning networks. So you're gonna take the infinite width limit, but, but I'm gonna take gamma to be some constant gamma zero times square root of n. So I'm gonna just stick to that parameterization for the rest of the talk. Okay, so let's talk a bit about training. So I need some loss function to train on. Um, so the loss function is just gonna be some average over a data density P of X of some loss on individual points X. Um, and I'm going to be kind of agnostic about what P of X looks like. So for instance, P of X could be a, a you know, discrete set of points, an atomic distribution on a discrete set of points, like P, capital P points. Or, you know, if I'm doing like small learning rate online learning, right, P of X could be just the same as the population, the test risk that I care about. I'm, the theory would work in either case. It's not really that important. But the point is, whatever my loss function is, I'm going to do some kind of gradient. Uh, in this talk, I'll talk about gradient flow, but you could do discrete time dynamics as well. But Let's just stick with gradient flow. So I'm thinking about, I have essentially a small learning rate. I could approximate the dynamics on weights as a differential equation. And it's basically the derivative of my loss with respect to weights. Now, why have I scaled uh, the learning rate with n? Um, we'll explain that in one second. But basically the story is that the predictor dynamics, so if I asked, you know, under this gradient flow on the weights, how is the prediction, the output of my model changing as a function of time? And it's basically governed by this object, this k object, which is a um, well, okay, so it depends on these error signals, delta, which are just local derivatives of the loss with respect to each output prediction. Um, but then it also depends on this object called the, the neural tangent kernel. And this is this object I'm, I'm going to allow to change over time. In general, all it is is it's just basically a contraction of um, the inner, so it's, it's sort of inner products of parameter gradients over all parameters in the model. And I need to, to upscale this uh, learning rate by n because I want this k to be order one. And in the scaling that I've adopted, the derivative of f with respect to each weight is order one over n to the three halves. So in this inner product, I have, uh, you know, sort of n squared numbers, each is one over n cubed. So I need to multiply by n to get some order one kernel to have order one learning and order one time. So that's that's the goal. And um, but my, my my key point is basically in this equation. If I knew how this NTK object was evolving over time, I could integrate this dynamics and identify how the predictor of the model is uh, is evolving. So the game is kind of in terms of the functional dynamics. If I could calculate this k object, I, I kind of know what my uh, predictions on, on test points will be. So that's that's uh, potentially helpful. And under gradient flow, um, yeah, we just talked about this. This is the, the NTK. And the NTK actually, so you could decompose it further. So you could decompose it in terms of these things called gradient kernels at each layer and feature kernels. Um, and so I'm first going to introduce this idea of a gradient. So this is basically the back propagation signal, G, which is the derivative of the output of the model with respect to one of the pre-activations. So one of the pre-activations in layer, uh, some hidden layer. And it's been scaled so that this is a, this, this vector has order one entries. And basically, uh, this NTK object is basically depends on these feature kernels, which are basically the firing rate in the, a hidden layer, sort of for data point X at training time T, and the firing rate for data point X prime at uh, training time S. So I need basically two... Uh, so, so each of these objects has a layer index, two uh, sample indices, and two time indices. And there's the same uh, for the gradients. So same for the backpropagation signals. I have basically these inner product kernels that I need to track. And if I know these things, I can get the NTK. And if I know the NTK, I can get the, the output predictor. Okay. So the spoiler of this thing is this order one parameter that controls feature learning, this gamma zero. If I took it to zero, something miraculous kind of happens, and we're, we're going to see why this happens. But basically, the, the NTK at time t is just going to be the same as the NTK at time zero. It's not going to move. So for instance, if I'm training on something like mean squared error, I have a very simple linear differential equation that tells me how my function evolves. And uh, you can do lots of analysis here. It's like suddenly like this complicated neural network model just became essentially a linear model, like essentially a kernel method. Um, but 
I mean, okay, as neuroscientists or as theorists, this is maybe problematic because there's no, while, while this thing can learn, like it's, a, it's an expressive space of functions, especially like while the, uh, you know, it's a, it's a complete Hilbert space um, where you can learn quite a bit of functions, uh, you know, and in some sense, it's it's not capturing the uh, sort of idea of representation learning where the, the internal uh, weights or the internal um, inputs to, to, to neurons or the way neurons respond to things are, are not really changing in this limit. So now we're going to ask, okay, if I turn on this gamma zero parameter, how do the kernels evolve in the rich regime? Okay, so to answer that, we can first just at finite n, write down an equation that basically tells me how the preactivations in each hidden layer at a data point x and time t depend on basically these kernel objects. So you get a recursion that basically uh, says that the, the preactivation vector of L plus one depends on the random initial weights times the instantaneous features in the previous layer, these five h plus basically some feature learning correction. So this integral thing is the sum of all the feature learning corrections up to time t. And um, so you see that if gamma zero goes to zero, that will die. And I just basically get the contribution from the initial weights. Okay, and then there's an analogous equation for the back propagation signal. I'm not gonna write it here, but in a couple slides, we'll get to that. Um, but the point is the above equation is exact. It's exact, it's an exact equation on like basically in dimensional vectors, so neuron dimensional sort of hidden vectors. Um, but it depends sort of on all of these sort of random initial weights, these W zeros. So just like in the DMFT for random RNNs, we'd like to have some way of averaging over that disorder or thinking about what happens at large N. And so you could do standard kind of field theoretic techniques like um, Martin Siguiero's kind of path integral technology or a dynamical cavity method to basically calculate what's gonna happen uh, in the limit. So you try translating this dynamics from this n-dimensional um, in dimensional equations that are deterministic conditional on the weights, the weights of initialization, into a stochastic process that describes this a typical neuron in the layer. Okay, and so there, yeah, the result is some single site stochastic process for each neuron in the layer. And um, what's going to happen? So at large n, these kernels, these phi and g kernels, these feature kernels and gradient kernels, they become non random and they become independent of basically the specific initialization w, the, the weights at time zero. Um, I get a single site sort of description of neurons in each layer where each neuron sort of becomes an IID draw from some single site process. So instead of a probability density on like a joint probability density on all n neurons in the hidden layer, this sort of ends up asymptotically factorizing into a product over uh, each neuron being a draw from the same marginal density on neurons. So for instance, in this plot, I'm making a histogram. So for a given, uh, for a given data point, at, and then the colors are different time points during the training, I make a histogram of like what each neuron's preactivation value was. And um, basically this, this sort of summarizes the, the population uh, statistics in the limit. And so the, the dashed black lines are sort of theoretical predictions of this density. The, the solid lines are this density at different points. Uh, but the point is just that basically this density sort of summarizes everything I need to know, at least asymptotically. I can think about each neuron as sort of like an IID draw from some population, uh, population density. And these, you know, original averages over neurons in a finite layer, in a finite dimensional, n-dimensional hidden layer, become basically integral averages over this single site density. So, okay, so if I, same, same kind of self-consistency idea, if I knew the single site density, I could calculate this integral and get the kernels. And if I knew the kernels, I can actually characterize the single site density. So that's the, that's the game. That's the self-consistent uh, field theory kind of thing. And um, I'll, I'll write these here. These, these equations are a little complicated, but they're not super important. So I'll go kind of quick, but the saddle point equations look like this. So basically, what I'm writing here is the, uh, for a typical neuron, what is the sort of stochastic description of that neuron's preactivation for data point x at time t? So it's a Gaussian random variable u plus uh, this gamma zero feature learning parameter times some integrated complicated thing. But notice this complicated thing depends on the data density p of x, it depends on the, the feature kernel phi, it depends on the errors delta, and it also depends on this object a that I'll introduce in a second that'll be a response function. And there's a similar equation for like basically that characterizes the G, the backward pass gradient signal. So the so the so there's a forward pass kind of description and there's a backward pass signal description. And these U's and R's that show up in these equations are Gaussians, like I mentioned. So this U is basically a Gaussian process with a covariance that's given by the, the feature kernel at the previous layer. And the R is a Gaussian process that's given by the, the gradient kernel at the next layer up. Okay. And um basically, okay, so each of these equations describe some statistical description of the preactivations H and the gradient's g. And if I want to get the um, sort of order parameters, I just do an average of the stochastic process. And to get the a's and b's, these response functions, I need to basically compute linear responses with respect to each of these, uh, each of these sources. Um, and I'll just, I'll just mention, if you're familiar with tensor programs from uh, Greg Yang and Hu, 
from uh, 2021, or the, the sort of PDE-like mean field description of uh, May and Montanari, you can derive some, in, in special cases, like you can, you can show that these equations recovered those previous kind of ideas of uh, descriptions of wide network feature in the feature learning regime. So that's cool. Um, and so just to show that this works, let's look at like a three-layer uh, tangent network. So a nonlinear three-layer network, where we're going to try sort of solving these equations for yeah, a long time ago, right? with a Monte Carlo method. So here um, in the first plot, I'm showing basically training loss for like a small gamma zero network. So a lazy network that's close to its kernel limit and a large gamma, like gamma zero equals one. So a very rich regime network. Okay, and you can see like early on, maybe the training losses are the same, but then I see the feature learning network starts, you know, updating its kernels and that sort of accelerates training late time. Uh, but the point is just the dashed lines are the theoretical predictions. And the point is that we, we can actually accurately kind of describe the difference between these models for like at least small data sets. And I'll explain sort of the limits of the Monte Carlo method that I'm uh, using. But the other thing is, you know, we have these single site densities. So these pre-activation densities here are, um, you, at initialization, they're sort of always Gaussian and they're, they're sort of easy to characterize. And I'm plotting them for different hidden layers and different colors here. But the point is that the, the pre-activation densities change over time. They're not the same at the beginning and at the end, but we, we can somewhat characterize them uh, throughout training. And um, there's basically, I think more, more interesting is these similarity matrices. So I'm training on a two class problem. And so the, the top block, the top few samples are from one class and the bottom few samples are another class. And I can see that the kernels are sort of like after training, the final kernels have this have evolved to sort of have this class structure where it's clustering data points within a class so that there's high similarity between class and low similarity across classes. Um, so that's something generic you see out of these kind of, kind of equations. And um, yeah, the theory is basically accurately predicting the, the kernels and also their dynamics. So they're, they're, in the middle plot, I'm showing basically a sum of overall samples of like the time time, uh, time by time matrices of these kernels. So it's, so it's not just capturing the, um, the sample by sample structure, but also the time by time structure. And I'm showing here on the, the right, just that as I increase the width of finite networks, I'm sort of getting closer and closer to the prediction of this, this limiting you know, DMFT uh, solution that I'm getting from Monte Carlo. So that's, that's nice. And there's a similar description for the gradient kernels that's also uh, sort of accurate um, and predictive. So, okay, so that's just showing that this works. The Monte Carlo procedure is, is complicated because you have to sort of sample sort of non-Gaussian random variables and take averages. There's a special case where you maintain Gaussianity throughout training in the limit, and that is basically the case of deep linear networks. Okay, so in a deep linear networks, all the equations close in terms of basically integral equations on correlation functions. And um, here you can still, you know, you can you can basically efficiently solve these equations and calculate what happens for different depth, you know, linear networks. And um, the theory is quite accurate. And I just want to mention, yeah, so there's no, you don't need any Monte Carlo methods or anything here. Um, and this recovers sort of known solutions, at least uh, in the limit of large infinite feature learning. So if you take this gamma zero knob to infinity, it actually kind of like recovers the small initialization description of uh, linear networks obtained by like uh, Andrew Sachs, and uh, colleagues in their in their work on linear networks. So you can you can recover a lot of different descriptions of networks from this you know these DMFT equations, which is kind of nice. And um, okay, so we talked a lot about gradient descent. It's unclear if the brain uh, is doing gradient descent. I mean, so there's lots of problems. One problem with gradient descent potentially is the weight transport issue, which is just that you know uh, I have these feedforward weights, and the feedforward weights are you know being updated over time, and maybe the uh, you know I need to basically network to compute some backward pass. Some gradient signals that are getting propagated backwards. If those were going to be a sep computed in a separate network, uh, they would have to be sort of. I would have to enforce what's called like weight symmetry, where like the, the forward pass weights would have to be exactly the transpose of the backward pass weights. And it's unclear how that would um, you know be enforced biologically. So there's been you know many other kind of learning rules, other many other kind of things that you could write down as potential candidates for like you know training a deep neural network. Uh, and I just want to show the flexibility of our approach lets you kind of like characterize the dynamics and representation learning dynamics of all these different kind of learning rules. So there's heavy learning where maybe you just update weights according to the correlation of two neurons in adjacent layers. There's direct feedback alignment where you project error signals through random weights that don't get updated, and then you only update the forward pass. Um, so why do these work and what kind of, you know, what kind of representations do these learn in the infinite neuron limit? So this is kind of an interesting question. Um, and basically, it's a very similar description to the DMFT I just presented. Uh, you know, the f of x, the output of the model, still evolves according to some dynamical NTK. But the dynamical NTK doesn't depend on the gradient-gradient inner product. It depends on a special g tilde. And this g tilde is basically what it is: is it's how aligned is the gradient I would have if I was doing 
backpropagation, that's the G, compared to the pseudo gradient G tilde, which is the gradient that's sort of computed with one of these. Yes. So, so each of these learning rules gives some, some description for basically an approximate gradient. So for feedback alignment, it's whatever I get by going through these random weights. And the question is how aligned is basically G tilde to G, so the, the real gradient. So for gradient descent, these are identical, right? And that's that's fine. But for other learning rules, like um, in general, G and G tilde do not have to be perfectly aligned. But what we're going to show is actually out of, out of these equations, you can see that if you allow the network to learn features, if you work in this infinite with feature learning limit, um, over time, you can see this improved kind of alignment in this G, G dot G kind of inner product. And that sort of accelerates training because it lets you learn with like more of the hidden layers. Um, so here's just a simple example for all these different learning rules, gradient descent, feedback alignment, gated linear networks, heavy in learning. And the dashed black line again is the DMFT description of these models. And this is the, the training loss over time. And then here I'm showing basically the, the trace over um, the samples of this G tilde matrix and just showing that the gradients and the pseudo gradients are sort of starting to align. So this thing is increasing over time for, um, for all of these different learning rules. And uh, the alignment of the, 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 so the sample by sample NTK matrix is also kind of like aligning to task relevant structure. So it's aligning to the labels like Y, Y transpose. So that's also increasing over time and in a way that you could characterize with the theory. And here I'm just plotting basically like the final G tildes for each of these learning rules and um, also the final feature kernels, which are all sort of like accurately predicted. So I'm just showing that this, um, this framework is flexible enough to deal with even these kind of learning rules that don't correspond necessarily to some uh, gradient descent or Langevin dynamics on, on an energy function. They're just sort of, you know, some complicated, uh, complicated thing. You have this asymmetric G tilde matrix, but that you can still calculate this correlation at, at large width. So that's sort of nice. Okay, so you know this has seemed really positive, but what are some kind of maybe limitations or drawbacks or, or challenges with this approach? Uh, so there's a practical issue, which is you know actually just calculating these these equations in this limit is actually pretty challenging, especially in the feature learning regime. If I don't do any feature learning, uh, a lot is known. I mean, basically this is the kernel limit. Um, I can solve basically every you know for everything I need in uh, order of samples cubed sort of time steps, right? On a, so, okay, what, what is P and what is T? I need to, to solve these equations, I need to sort of solve on a finite set of data points, P, and I need to discretize time into T steps, right? So for the lazy limit, it's just P cubed, but for the full DMFT, I need sort of P cubed, T cubed kind of time complexity to, to solve all of these equations, which is just not ideal. And if I just trained a really wide neural network or within neural network, right? That would be like N squared PT for the time complexity. Okay, so this procedure that I've described it's only going to be really faster, uh, just as a numerical method, than, salt, than than running gradient descent on a big network, if um, the number of hidden neurons is much bigger than sort of samples times time, right? So it's unclear that like, okay, on realistic scale networks, you know, if I'm training on ImageNet or something, like this is not the the relevant kind of regime. So like, it's potentially faster just to train the network. So that's that's not ideal. But I think more interesting, even than the just like the practical things, this this gives you some limiting description, some limiting stochastic process. I derived this description in a in a way where I kept you know samples and training time as order one quantities. I wasn't scaling them jointly with n in any way. Is that a problem? Uh, so you know this is potentially a theoretical issue. Um, so to to address this, we've tried doing two things. We've we've tried basically empirically just studying network dynamics across different widths, and also theoretically kind of trying to characterize leading corrections to the to the DMFT using some perturbation theory. And I'll describe each of these. So here quickly. All right, so this is a, I'm showing here the loss curve for a ResNet trained on CIFAR 5M. So this is an extension of CIFAR 10 to five to a, a data set with 5 million examples. Okay, 5 million is much, much bigger than any of the widths that I'm plotting here. But all the widths are basically, like across all these different widths, I'm basically learning the, the same function. I have essentially the same loss curve. So the DMFT description is actually pretty valid, I think, for this for this model. On more complicated uh, sort of tasks, or or like like ImageNet, which have like a thousand classes and also like millions of data points, there are more significant gaps across widths. So the wider networks tend to be the best, and narrower networks tend to be worse in some kind of like predictable way. And not, not that we have theoretical predictions, but just in some sort of systematic way that the gaps grow over time. And um, it's yeah, you have to go much wider to sort of converge to the limit. And uh, similarly, we've tried doing like uh, transformers on sort of mass language modeling on Wikipedia. And also you have this effect of like compounding finite size effects over time. So, um, however, I will say when this works, it really works. So if I look at that CIFAR 5M example, uh, so the CIFAR example, um, and I look at a hidden layer and I plot basically these single site densities, these pre-activation histograms, uh, 
across different widths, the pre-activation histograms are strikingly consistent. So this very very much is a, you know in agreement with the kind of mean field philosophy. So before and after training, even after after training, the density is not Gaussian. So it's not well described by like a the best Gaussian fit. There are all all the densities are still very close to one another, which sort of suggests that like it's it's operating close to this mean field limit. And further, the sort of feature kernels you get uh, before and after training are strikingly consistent across widths. So even though the feature kernels move quite a bit, so they go from this uh, top row initial kernels to the bottom row the final kernels. Across different widths, um, they're quite they're quite uh, similar. Um, and you can check out our new our new our new work. It'll be at NERPS, and we have more experiments sort of quantifying these things. Uh, there's also sort of a perturbative description you can try to do. So you know, at leading order, you can calculate corrections to this mean field description in like powers of one over n. So the the, the story is basically you get a one over n mean correction to all the order parameters, all the correlation response and response functions, and you get an order like one over square root of n random Gaussian fluctuation. Um, and uh, also for the predictor of the model. So the output of the model is a, some one over n mean correction and then a one over square root of n kind of fluctuation. And um, we really focus on the variance term, which seems in some cases to dominate, at least when you're really close to this limit. And uh, you can calculate the dynamical structure of these, these, these random fluctuations of order parameters. And here's just an example showing like you can get at least sort of an approximate description of the finite width network uh, at leading order. Um, from this leading order theory uh, across different, like, let's say, sample sizes P and different widths N. And if you have a completely kind of unstructured data set, we have a toy model that shows that, like, the corrections uh, the corrections can be as large as sort of P over N, uh, just, just from this analysis, which is um, problematic. Now, let me just state also that this these finite uh, width effects are not helpful. They're actually, once you've adopted this parameterization where you're keeping feature learning fixed, uh, wider is always sort of tends to be better, right? So the dashed black lines in these plots are like the infinite width things, and then each color is sort of like a different finite width. So you're sort of accumulating uh, corrections that make the model kind of worse and worse. Um, yeah, so that's that's sort of generally the story. Okay, what about depth? So recently we've been thinking not just, you know, I, I've described a lot about like large width. Could you take a large depth limit of, of, of a network? What kind of thing would it learn? Um, what, what motivates this? It's just that modern networks are, you know, on the order of like hundreds of hundreds, 100 or 200 layers, uh, like GPT-4 is you know, rumored to have like 120 layers. Um, so it would be nice if we could have, and also these things are usually resonance, right? So they usually have like skip connections and then uh, also they add basically what each, they add a residual term um, that goes through weights. And then can we characterize basically in these kinds of networks, what happens is the depth L goes to infinity. And um, can we get hyperparameter transfer? So hyperparameter transfer is this philosophy or this idea of like, if I have a small network and I know kind of like what learning rates and batch sizes and uh, you know, momentum parameters, whatever, all these hyperparameters that work in the small model, it would be really nice if they also worked in the larger model, or if I had kind of consistent performance or consistent stable dynamics with the same learning rates and stuff at the larger scale. Um, we don't currently have that. Normal networks, we don't have basically this, uh, this hyperparameter transfer across depths, um, but for a certain class of uh, ResNets in a new paper, we, we argue for a method that can deliver this sort of hyperparameter transfer. Um, and that was with these authors, so you can check out the preprint if you're interested. But the idea is basically we study um, we study ResNets with scaled branches. So a ResNet is a res you know, so the preactivations in L plus one are equal to the preactive. So there's a, what's called a skip connection. It's equal to the preactivations at layer L plus basically a residual term. And this residual is going to I'm going to scale it down by one over square root of uh, depth. Okay, and uh, what what you can show that's kind of nice is all the um, order parameters that I described, all the feature kernels. All of the uh, you know the predictor, the output of the model, all of these things have some well-defined infinite width and depth limit. So you can take the joint limit, and it doesn't actually matter which order you take the limit in. And the story of like how do you describe the infinite depth limit? What is it? It's basically an average over a stochastic process in layer time. So I introduced this notion of tau, which is like uh, the current layer index little l over capital L. So this, this becomes a real number in the limit between zero and one. And so it's saying like, you know, if I go a fraction, you know, three quarters of the way through the network, like what's happening at that sort of layer time. So that would, that would be tau equals three quarters. And so what you get is you get a DMFT description on this preactivation H at layer time tau at data point X and at time T. And it has sort of two parts. It has, the first part is some integrated Brownian motion. And this is very much like the lazy term, the term that you'd have if there was no feature learning plus a feature learning term that is morally the same as what I presented before, but has some integral over, over layer times less than tau, because you're accumulating all of these feature updates through the, the, through the skip connections. Uh, 
And this Brownian motion has some covariance that's uh, basically um, local in layer time, but across samples and across uh, training times, it has the covariance given by the feature kernel that I've introduced. And the kernels are still kind of computed as self-consistently self as single side averages. Um, and then, okay, so how is a finite depth network different than an infinite depth network? The finite depth network is basically some like Euler uh, discretization of the infinite depth uh, continuous process that I'm describing here. So it's basically, I cut up this unit interval from tau going from zero to one into uh, L little uh, segments. And then I solve some discrete uh, equations with, and so, so I get it basically discretization errors in the, in the dynamics uh, when I go to finite depth. Okay, and so here's just showing like, okay, is there anything practical to, to be gained from any of these limits? Like, is there anything that actually like helps me as a practitioner, maybe train my models better? So here on the left, I'm basically showing that even if I'm in this mean field kind of scaling where I get more or less consistent dynamics across widths, as I vary depth, the dependence of the model's final train loss, let's say, on learning rate uh, is not consistent. So as I make the model sort of deeper and deeper, I see that like some of the models uh, start diverging, especially at large depth, and the optimal learning rate sort of shifts to the left, right? So on the left, you can see like the depth 30 model is only training for two, like it's only like, a, it diverges for every point except these last, these very small learning rates. Um, so the optimal hyperparameters are not the same across different depths. However, if you do this scaling trick so that you converge to a limit at large depth, then now all of a sudden I can train these much deeper networks and I get slightly better performance. And I also have the same kind of optimal learning rate across all the depths. So across width and depth, now I have the same sort of optimal learning rate at a star. So that's sort of the, the trick. And the reasoning is that the, this happens basically because you're, you're converging to some kind of limit. And um, yeah, so the philosophy is you could sweep over all your hyperparameters from the very small model and then use those best, the best possible hyperparameters that you found. You could use those same ones in the, when you train the big model. So it sort of could save you some, some cost. And like what causes this transfer? So you want the model to be sort of, you want to control finite size approximation errors. And that's the philosophy. So if you have a parameterization where you're controlling finite size approximation errors in the dynamics, then the dependence on hyperparameters should be similar. So here I'm showing a bunch of different learning rates and I'm showing two different depths. You can see the losses are not identical across different depths, but the sort of dependence on learning rate is pretty consistent. Um, so that's that's the idea. And you can do the same thing with, I don't know, varying momentum parameters or varying the schema zero feature learning parameter. It's the same kind of story. Okay, and uh, just to show you, you could do this in very large things, like you could do like um like a big vision transformer, train on tiny image net for like 100 epochs or something, and like the optimal learning rates or the dependence on learning rate across these different depths and widths are uh, very consistent. So the same optimal learning rate is shared across all these models. And once you're in a parameterization where I think you can converge to limits in different ways, I think it's natural you could ask, how should I trade off width and depth? Um, what is the sort of compute optimal frontier? So, I mean, this is sort of in progress. We don't have a lot on this, but I think it's sort of an interesting future direction. Um, I don't know how good I am on time, but basically we're thinking now a little bit about like RNNs, like trained RNNs. I might uh, go through this a little faster because I know we're, um, I, I could come back if there's questions, but basically we're trying to characterize like in a trained RNN, if I train some RNN jointly, like could I characterize maybe the final internal dynamics of the RNN, see how the autocorrelation of the RNN sort of like um, evolves based on the structure of the task. How does it pick up? Uh, interesting signals from the task. So, um, okay, so what are some like open problems with this general kind of like approach or like challenges with this approach? So I, I don't think that the current description of the infinite width limit, so the infinite width limit we saw is like tends to be kind of the best among all uh, models in the same architecture once you've adopted this parameterization where feature learning is consistent. But this is not a theory of scaling laws. It doesn't tell me, for instance, why if I train a finite width network of within, um, I converge to the limit actually sometimes like n to minus alpha for some alpha that's not equal to one. So I showed you a perturbation theory that basically says, okay, provided I'm expanding around this like infinitely over parameterized model and I capture these fluctuation effects, everything should converge at a rate like one over n. Okay, that's the, that's the perturbative story. But you know, in practice, when you're trained for a very, very long time, you're essentially, essentially in a model that's like under parameterized. You see these other alternative kind of scaling laws into some weird power. Um, like width or parameters to some weird power. And even in our experiments, uh, in our in, in the paper I was alluding to, this uh, this empirical study, if you look at, so CIFAR, it's, it's closer to this perturbative thing, but like the, the really complicated uh, data sets like ImageNet and um, like Wikipedia, uh, like language modeling, you see these other kind of scaling laws. So I think, you know, it, it's not clear that the technology I presented here is capable of explaining these kinds of uh, scaling phenomena. And then the other thing, um, 
is sort of architectural or task specificity. So like, why is the DMFT description super accurate for some data distributions and uh, some architectures, but not for others? Um, and then, yeah, so various comparison of architectures. So if I was going to do something like a width versus depth in a parameterization that admits a joint limit, like, uh, is it better to go, all, if I hold compute constant, is it better to go wider or deeper? Also, in terms of compute optimality, is it better to train longer with a small model or train a larger model for a shorter amount of time? Um, and just other types of architectures. Uh, so can I characterize maybe like what happens in RNNs? Can I characterize what happens in, uh, you know, like self-attention layers, transformers? So like all of this, I think, is pretty, uh, pretty open. I don't think there's a lot that's known here. Um, so yeah, uh, with that, you know, I, I'm uh, really appreciative of uh, everyone's time and I'd just like to thank all my wonderful collaborators and my sources of funding, especially Jengis Pelavon, my advisor, who was you know, involved on all of these projects.